for having me, uh, Bombay Local, in this absolutely wonderful venue, uh, spectacular space, terrific bookstore. Uh, you think I need the mic? Because I have a pretty loud... Yeah? I think it's... You can all hear me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I do have a theatre voice. I did do a little bit of theatre at some point, some of which might come in, come in here. Uh, but basically when I was asked to do this uh, by Sanjana and Samira Iyengar, who's not here today, we had a chat in Delhi and I said, what kind of thing, what kind of audience? Uh, and I had done this little talk uh, that I'm going to give to you today for the Delhi Photo Festival a few weeks ago. And there I decided to do something which was fairly personal uh, and I don't apologize for that. I thought, let me do it as a, as a sort of personal story, a journey uh, about wha what I do and why I do it. It was really oriented towards younger photographers uh, because the photo scene in India has really exploded in the last few years. Uh, the time that I started out you know, we didn't have access to cameras, film was difficult to get here. Uh, so it was, it was a scene which was quite small. Uh, most photographers were press photographers, some industrial, but very few people who were doing independent work. Uh, and I was part of the generation that started doing that uh, in the 1970s. <coughs> so basically, uh, what I thought I would begin with is a little uh, is a little background of where I come from, uh, and I come from there. Those are my parents. <laughs> that's uh, beginning with my father and my mother. That's uh, New York, 1946. My father was an architect. He had just graduated from MIT uh, in architecture. He was one of the first Indians. Uh, actually to study architecture in the U.S., but also there were very few Indian students who went to the U.S. at that time, because most of us used to go to England as the colonial power. Uh, so there were handfuls of Indians uh, studying in, in the U.S. at that time. And my mother, whose mother was American, <coughs> had a strange history which I'll not go into, but she had come to India in the 1920s because she believed she was an Indian in her past life and had married my grandfather who was a Bajpai, Ramlal Bajpai in, in New York and was running around in the 1920s as Ragini Devi, became an Indian dancer in New York, uh, wearing saris in Brooklyn, etc. Anyway, she ran away to India with Harindranath Chattopadhyay in 1929 and my mother was born here. She went back with the Kathakali troop to Europe and got stuck during the war. And she and my mother uh, crossed the Atlantic back to the protection of her parents in, in Michigan. Ended up in New York. Father ended up in New York after he graduated. He was 30 years old and my mother was 15. She was in high school in New York and she eloped with my father. And my sister was born in Calcutta in 1946, uh, when my mother was 16 years old. <coughs> my mother became a dancer. That's part of so the, the background I come from is father of Muslim family origin, militant anti-religious atheist, mother half American, half uh, Indian, uh, little more religious because her dance got quite involved with. Uh, religious themes or mythological themes. <clears throat> My father comes back, he had got a, a West Bengal government scholarship to go to MIT. So he came back to India and he was working for the Bengal Public Works Department as an architect. And this is a picture of him, uh, he was a very good photographer himself. This is a self-portrait. He loved photographing both himself and my mother all the time. This is a picture of him uh, with a model of the new Secretariat building in Calcutta, which was one of the first uh, steel frame structures 
built in India at the time. This is uh, this picture is from about 1950. Uh, so he was working for the West Wing World Government. This is a picture that he took of my mother. This is roughly 1949. She goes off to Madras uh, and Tanjo and studies uh, with the Tanjo Gurus and becomes uh, a fairly well-known, actually very well-known dancer very early on. She is 19 years old here. <coughs> they moved to Delhi in about 1952-1953 because my father had done the first memorial to Gandhi uh, in Barakpur outside Calcutta and Nehru had come to inaugurate that and that's part of a much longer lecture that I'm doing actually at the Bhaudaji Lard Museum on Saturday which is about modernist architecture of Delhi 1947-1950 uh, but Nehru brings my father to Delhi because he meets him at that site he loves what he did it was a, a modernist structure but with uh, with references to religious traditions, but made with, you know, more poured concrete, vaults, etc. Nehru loved it. He said, this is just uh, my cup of tea. It was the Nehruvian India. So he makes, he gets my father shifted to Delhi to the public works department, because he said, we need people like you in the capital. So my parents, you know, in, a, in many ways, really embodied that whole Nehruvian India as an architect and as a dancer. And this is a picture of uh, Rashpati Bhavan. This is shot by Humay Vairavada actually. Uh, discovered after she passed away in the archive. And uh, that's my mother on the left, who in the meantime, over all this journey, this is sometime in the early 1960s, she became the first Miss India at Brabourne Stadium, uh, not far from here. Her name was Indrani, Indrani Rahman. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've seen your mother dance. Ah, okay. So that's her on the left, uh, and that's uh, uh, Roshan Bajivta yeah. uh, next to her, who was the uh, who was the sister of Shirin Bajivta, who was married to Mulkra Janan. Next to Nehru is uh, Yamini Krishnamurti, a very young Yamini. And behind Yamini is her very talented uh, sister Jyotishmati, who was a singer, etc., and kind of vanished from the public eye. So, you know, this was this was the milieu uh, that I was brought up in, and it was very connected to Nehru, actually. <coughs> yeah, and that uh, is my father with Nehru. Uh, this is the building of Rabindra Bhavan, which was the building uh, in commemoration of Tagore for his 100th birth anniversary. Nehru had uh, uh, ordained that these theatres and cultural centres be set up in the capital of all the states uh, in memory of Tagore. And this particular building, the initial plan that my father did was like a corporate building. And Nehru took one look at it and hated it. And in, my father had also done the Molana Azad memorial in uh, Old Delhi in front of the Jama Masjid, which again was an abstract structure, but alluding to Mughal architecture, which Nehru had also loved. So when he saw that corporate building, he you know yelled at my dad and said, "What is this? This has nothing to do with Tagore." And my father came back very traumatized, saying, "He said, you know, you've done these memorials, and he said that those are memorials I've done, not buildings." And, you know, I haven't done a building which has a spirit like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he goaded him into making the Rabindra Bhavan, which became a classic, uh, which was finished in 1961. Uh, and that's the building as it looked then. <clears throat> this was some of the other uh, modernist architecture my father was doing. This is the Curzon Road Hostels, 1967. Um, and these are his photographs. And this picture actually is of two buildings. The front building, the arch, is uh, by Achyut Kanvinde, who had followed my father to MIT and Harvard, graduated in 1950. And that's my father's uh, Indraprastha building in the back. 
And I love this picture because both of them were students of Walter Gropius, uh, who was the great Bauhaus uh, architect. And that's uh, the Indra Prasta. That's Joseph Allen Stein and my father and myself in the Delhi Zoo. The Delhi Zoo was designed by my father. So again, this is just to give you, you know, a, an idea of the kind of cultural or intellectual milieu that as a bacha I was uh, exposed to. This is a picture by my father that's uh, in the Gujral on the left. And the only one who's barefoot in this picture is my mother. Uh, holding me and that's Satish Gujral next to her when he was young and rather bald uh, he grew a big head of hair in, later on uh, strangely and uh, next to Satish is uh, M.F. Hussain who was introduced to Satish in our house Hussain was staying with us this is about 1950 I, was, I just turned 60 on Monday so this is about 1957 this picture and that's Charles Fabry, who was the great uh, art critic, uh, art uh, historian, who had come to India with Oral Stein. Uh, I also studied dance for a little while uh, as a kid, when I was in school. But a different style from my mother. I had uh, uh, Karakshetra Lalita Shastri as my teacher. She used to be in uh, Pandara Road, near where we lived. Uh, traveled in Russia as a young kid and this is uh, this, this, this was my first magazine cover appearance <laughs> and this actually was pa partly targeted at Pablo Bartholomew who's in the audience in Delhi because uh, uh, Pablo and I wrote on each other in platform magazine and Pablo wrote a long thing on this magazine saying you know that that this guy came back from Russia and he was on a magazine cover and he wouldn't stop talking about it. <laughs> so this was something Pablo never got over. Especially my making 600 new friends. <laughs> and that's Pablo there on the right. Uh, this is modern school uh, in Delhi where all the, the children of all the artists, musicians, dancers were all in modern school. We, uh, so all the kids grew up together, the Alkazi children, Taya Mehta's kids, uh, uh, Richard, Pablo, the Bartholomew kids, uh, who are the kids? Uh, Krishan Khanna kids. And, they, and it was because the principal of modern school actually made a, uh, an effort to bring all these. Uh, Amjad Ali Khan, who's like nine years older than me. Uh, yeah, Amjad was also modern school. Uh, uh, Gandharva Mah Mahavidyalaya kids, Madhvi Mudgal, her brother, etc. Because uh, Emin Kapoor thought by bringing these kids of these creative people, he would, you know, generate some uh, frisson in the school, which he did, but not quite in the way he uh, expected. Pablo was thrown out for drugs, uh, as was Aloknath. Now I, uh, you know, I grew up with these photographs. Now these photographers, I, I realized later in my life, were, were really major, fabulous photographers. This is a photograph by Ahmad Ali, who is still alive. He's about 93 or 94 years old in Calcutta, um, whose daughter happens to be Nafis Ali, the swimming champion. Uh, so this is uh, Ahmad Ali of my mother. Oh, that's my grandmother. That's uh, Esther Luella Sherman from Petoskey, Michigan, who became Ragini Devi, uh, and lived in Bombay for many years, actually, for the, you know much of the rest of her life. This photograph is by Shunil Jana, uh, of which there's a big retrospective that I've curated, which is up now at the National Gallery of Modern Art, vintage prints, including one of uh, my grandmother. These are prints which were newly discovered in Delhi. Do go see that show, it's up till Sunday. Yes. National Gallery of Modern Art in uh, yeah, Prince of Wales. That's also my grandma, by Shunil Jana. My mother, by Jana. Did she ever perform in the US? Did she go back to Michigan? Who, my mother? You got your grandmother? 
Uh, she did. It, I mean, she was dancing in New York. That's the picture of my father and my mother. They were in her troupe. Oh, okay. That's where my father ran away with my mother from. Uh, I mean, he was an architect, but he was very good looking and had a nice body. And he could play the flute. So she threw him on the stage. So these are all Shunil Jana. And this is by Kishore Parikh. Uh, another legendary photographer, but very little known for this kind of, uh, of work. So, you know, as a bacha, I, these people were coming in and out of the house. I didn't realize really who they were or what, that I would get into uh, their profession. This is a portrait of me by Kishore. And that's a picture of my mother dancing in horse cars, also by Kishore. Very few people know that he did a whole slew of dance pictures of my mother and I have a whole set of vintage prints which will come out one day. And that's Ahmad Ali. This was two years ago in Delhi uh, when I did a, uh, an interview with him which is online by the way. So if you Google my name and Ahmad Ali, it's a very nice interview with this pretty amazing man uh, who was about 90 at that time. The first two pictures done on my leg. They're very famous. They were shown before. Well, they're also the Jana pictures of the tribals, yeah. which are in the. You might be thinking of the Jana ones. But these are excellent. Yeah. yeah. So are these your pictures that you took in the one in the background? No, no, those are Ahmad Ali's pictures okay. in the back. Yeah. And this is. Um, uh, T.S. Nagarajan, who's another legendary photographer who passed away a few years ago. This is me with him in Bangalore. And this is my portrait of T.S. Satyan, his brother, uh, and his wife in Mysore. So what happens is I go off to the U.S. And that's me in the U.S. That's me with the long hair in the front, in a striped shirt, in my uh, post Beatle days. <laughs> And this is at MIT. So I follow my father to MIT and I went to MIT to study physics. <laughs> and I, you know, and of course at MIT it was an amazing experience because you have to do various arts courses along with your, uh, with your science. So I started doing photography, which was across the road, and there was an amazing lab, an amazing dark room, incredible teachers. And for the first time I got exposed to a history of photography which was almost like our first class, uh, which is where I suddenly became aware of the fact of all these people who I knew as a, as a kid. I suddenly thought, my God, you know, here are these people whose work I lived with and was in the house, but I had never thought of them as serious artists or serious photographers. It was my exposure in America that made me think and also made me realize that we don't have a written history or a collected history of the work of these people. Uh, this is actually in the, in the architecture department. This was a class run by a very mad but incredibly talented uh, designer, Muriel Cooper, uh, who was the designer of MIT Press. And this was a, a offset press and her first class in design was to show you how to run the press, how to put the ink, how to make a plate, and then she says, okay, start. And the, my photography training was almost similar because it begins immediately with exposing film processing. So it was like instant hands-on uh, craft. I did have a science background and this is, a, this is a photo connect in MIT. I did the strobe photography lab with the legendary Harold Edgerton. Who was, who was the man who invented the, the flash, the strobe. He invented it during the Second World War. And my father had seen that lab when he was a student in the, in the mid-40s. And I ended up being a student of, uh, of Charlie Miller and Harold Edgerton. And these were the notebooks I pulled out two weeks ago. Um, it's the famous pictures you all know of the bullets going through the apples and yeah. the milk drop, etc. So we all did exactly the same thing with the same setup that he had built all those years ago with his strobes. 
Uh, but I was showing these to the students saying that, you know, you see this stuff that I actually did do a bit of science. <laughs> so I was educated. This was also directed at Pablo. You know, he never got educated. He never finished school. So, uh, so this was, hello, Pablo. You know, I mean, I did have some education. That's my milk drop. <laughs> And that's the bullet going through the milk carton. And the bullet going through the cigarette. And you see I got a very good uh, comment on the pictures. After MIT I didn't know, uh, I ended up getting a, a strange degree called the Bachelor of Science in Art and Design. MIT was a place which kind of opened your mind and opened your windows and kind of allowed you to drift and physics went out the door because I realized you know I'm not going to be in a lab fighting for funds to do research etc. Once, once I saw what the, uh, what the reality of research was and also I wasn't very good I realized I me mean, sitting in a place first of all when I went to MIT I thought they'd made a terrible mistake by admitting me because I was at the bottom of my class in, in modern school and suddenly I get a scholarship, full scholarship and end up there. Anyway, it turned out an amazing experience. Uh, Muriel Cooper sent me off to Yale to do graphic design and I absolutely hated Yale. It was completely the opposite of, uh, of MIT. It was uh, mentally restricting, conservative, racist, uh, class written, you know, they were very interested in, in your background. MIT was completely different. You had these Korean students who didn't bathe and were living in the, in the, in the library, but were brilliant mathematicians, you know, and that's what MIT was interested in, in uh, what you had in your head. They didn't care who your father was or your mother was. Yale was totally different. But why didn't they bathe? No, I'm, that's that's another long story. Uh, social skills uh, were not uh, were not. Uh, yeah, this is me in uh, in Yale in the art school at the beginning of my rebellion, which is taking place around my desk. Uh, but this also has a photo connection because this is shot by Philip Lorca de Corsha, who's a classmate who's ended up becoming one of the most famous uh, photographers, color photography in the U.S. But this is a very early work by, by PL. That was my, that was my graduation in Yale. Uh, I constructed this desk and I wore it on my head uh, at graduation. I did get my degree but barely because there was a big battle between uh, the head of my department. Uh, I ended up going to the president of Yale which I didn't know. Uh, which I found out two years later. You know, but, uh, I do have a degree, uh, like Smriti Irani, <laughs> who also went to Yale. Was she also in Yale? Yeah, she's a graduate of Yale, she says. <laughs> I moved to New York and uh, with, a, with a, a classmate friend of mine, we found uh, a raw loft in the Fulton Fish Market. This was a time, this is the late 1970s, 1979, when you could still find places like that in New York, live there with no money. Uh, this didn't have windows, it had stairs coming up to our floor and then other stairs going up to the next floor. Uh, we had to build the whole thing, so this is the bedroom I built. This happens to be a Halloween party, this is not, you know, like normal uh, attire. And that's uh, the photographer Lee Friedlander and his wife Maria uh, in the loft, also at a Halloween party. And sitting in the middle is another photographer, Lois Connor. When I came back to Delhi, I was coming back and forth uh, in, for about 20 years, you know, keeping my loft, but working in, in Delhi, working there freelance, not quite knowing what I was doing went and designed a magazine in Bangalore for a while with the uh, Deccan Herald, which was actually a job uh, in which uh, my fellow journalist sitting in the back, Feroz Chandra, was uh, was senior correspondent. 
this was in the 80s, 82, 83, 84. But because I knew all these architects and I had started doing photography fairly seriously, they all asked me to photograph their buildings uh, in Delhi. And as I got serious about it, I realized that, you know, my little camera was not good enough. So I ended up getting a Sinar, a view camera, uh, primarily to do architectural photography because it had all the adjustments to keep uh, perspective correct, got a very wide angle lens, was using uh, roll film backs, etc. So that's me with the Sinar. And this is the kind of work I started doing, but this also is my father's um, 1961 building, which he did sort of secretly and privately. This is the Sheila Theatre in Delhi, the movie theatre. It was the first 70mm uh, theatre in Delhi. And the colours and the murals here were done by a young Canadian architect called Luc Durand, who was a very good friend of Pierre Jeanneret, uh, the cousin of Le Corbusier and Jeanneret had was working with Corbu in Chandigarh, became very close to my father. So this in a way is, is a, a ghost of Chandigarh in Delhi in my dad's work. These are shot not too long ago by the way, the theatre has been kept in a pretty immaculate condition, which is very rare for a, for a modern building. So this was the work, the kind of work that I was doing to make a living. This was, you know, I was doing this as, as, as job work. I got paid by magazines, by architects, etc. to do this. Uh, this is IMP's uh, Islamic uh, Art Museum in Qatar, uh, where I had gone for Hussein's 95th birthday, which was in this museum. And this is what I'm doing now. This is um, photographing the Rashtrapati Bhavan again. I'm in the middle of this project. Uh, so this is my, you know, professional, hardcore professional work. Sorry, these are big files. That's also the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Edwin Latians, uh, the British. This is the 35 millimeter work I had started to do while at MIT. Uh, this, of course, is Madras, uh, Mahabalipuram, and that, Sravan Bilbola. But very early on, um, Philip Lorca de Corsha, the, the PL, was looking at my work and he said to me, he said, you know, your work really calls for a larger format camera. You should go uh, to 120 film, and partly the reason was that he wanted me to sell. Uh, he wanted me to buy his 120 camera <laughs> because he wanted to get another one. So I did buy the camera, it, but it was an amazing camera. It was a folding range finder, six by seven. It was a Plowbell Machina, which had a fixed lens, Nikon lens, uh, and I found it. You know, PL was absolutely dead right because I found the discipline that the camera imposed, you couldn't change lenses, you couldn't do zooms, you couldn't do wide angles, uh, you had 10 frames on, a, on, on one film, the film was expensive, you know, I was doing all the processing myself, so you really had to think about the pictures you were making. And I'm showing you this because this is a picture uh, slightly unusual for me, I had gone with uh, Romy Kosla, the architect, to do uh, uh, photographs of buildings in Malana, in Himachal, which was this very strange, remote village which had its own uh, uh, sort of belief systems, legal systems, etc., very resistant to outsiders. And I was not photographing women there at all. As it is, I had lied, you know, I didn't say I was a, you know, half a Muslim, you know, when I enter those kinds of situations like temples in the south, I become Ram Raman and I invoke the Bajpai end of my ancestry uh, so that I don't have any, you know, problems. So there I was Ram Raman, but this woman, 
you know, insisted, I was on a rock and she insisted that I make a picture of her with her baby and she was feeding her baby. And I, I was very nervous about doing this because I didn't want it, you know, to be taken uh, in a wrong manner. If you go see the Shunil Jana pictures at the National Gallery of Modern Art, which were done in the 1940s and the 50s, he's done these amazing pictures of women in rural India and villages, almost all of whom are bare-breasted because they only wore a lower, lower garment, many of them. It's very different because there's a complete ease and a connect. And this is a you know young man photographing, very different from the time when I went to Malana. Anyway, I made this picture. As part of my education in, uh, my history education, I had been exposed to the work of Walker Evans, who used to teach in Yale, but had died uh, like a year before I went to Yale. So suddenly in Yale, I'm surrounded by this, you know, mythology of Walker Evans, who's a great American photographer, whose work was very dry, very documentary, and I had found it kind of boring. But I made this picture, processed it in Delhi in my bathroom and made a print and suddenly something went bang in my head. This is a close-up. And this is a picture by Walker Evans. Uh, this is uh, Fannie Mae Burroughs in, in Alabama during the Great Depression. And I looked at that picture in the bathroom and I thought, oh my God. And those were the days, of course, no internet, communication was difficult. I didn't have a Walker Evans book. I wrote to my friend Paul, I said, please mail me that paperback from the Museum of Modern Art. I, I want to see that photograph. Uh, so he mailed me the book, and there, there she was, and you know, I thought, my God, this is really uncanny. Can you please go back to the picture? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it could almost, it could almost be the same uh, person, or at least the same spirit. So I started looking at Evans because of this and I got fascinated and I realized uh, the richness of Evans's work and this is a tribute to one of Evans's pictures. Uh, this is a photo studio in Connaught Place which of course doesn't look anything like this now. Uh, but this was kind of an almost history of modern India right there on the wall. And what struck me about Evans's work was, uh, you know, his work stylistically was looked quite ordinary but there was an intensity of looking in the photographs and you realize that that you know what is contained in the photograph has immense layers of meaning about the history of that place the culture of that place the ethos of that place so i really started looking uh, at making pictures like that that very much came out of this I'm just going to go through some images without talking too much. Uh, these are all made with the plow bell, uh, 120. That's Sri Devi. And a couple different things uh, uh, started happening. You know, sometimes pictures like this uh, were reflective of my own uh, slightly wacky sense of humor. Uh, and my own eye, and my own enjoyment at, at the quirkiness, particularly in India, that you find everywhere. We have such an amazing street culture, uh, and people create these environments, you know, almost without thinking, or multiple people create them, which have both humor in them, which have politics, which have cultural references, which have mythology, uh, and I really see it like, you know, uh, people's art. And a lot of it much more interesting than a lot of the art you see in galleries. This was a water fountain. <laughs> this was a photograph that deeply upset a lady in New York. I'd shown it in, a, in an exhibition and there was this uh, American lady who came there and she, she freaked out. She got like really agitated and I was sitting there and she said, what is this photograph? Uh, you know, what is it about? And I said, well, it's what you see. You know? <laughs> she said, yes, but what is happening? I said, well, I actually don't know what is happening in the picture. I just, you know, saw it and took it. She was very disturbed by the fact that this dog was feeding uh, the baby. 
with a with a milk bottle. I mean, she got really disturbed by the photograph. What was the problem with it? I had no idea. You know, she didn't articulate more than that uh, agitation. Since I couldn't explain the photograph to her. This is in Delhi. <laughs> okay. Uh, this was in Cochin. Uh, this is Francis Bacon in Cochin. Uh, I don't know who would go to this tailor, you know, but uh, that was his sign. This is in Delhi. And I'm gonna. That was Delhi. <laughs> that was when Arjun Singh had split, and I think maybe Narasimha Rao had gone at night and pulled his head down. Uh, this was on a traffic circle. Uh, and this is uh, this is not Bhagat Singh. This is Bobby Deol as Bhagat Singh. <laughs> And that's uh, Jawaharlal fairly recently, which is very reflective of where Jawaharlal is now um, and what is sought to be done to him uh, by the current regime. That's Calcutta, that's Vajpayee, of course. <laughs> Bupen, Bupen Kakar, the artist. It's Francis Souza. Now these again are, are the milieu, you know, who I was involved with, grew up with, became friends with. They were friends with my parents, I became friends with them. And I realized that a lot of the work that I was doing was actually around my own life. So I wasn't I wasn't a press reporter, I wasn't going out looking for stories. I was actually making pictures around my uh, normal uh, existence, everyday existence. It happened to be with some, some with you know people like this. It's Rekharad Vidya. This was a picture that launched a thousand uh, uh, troubles amongst various uh, members of the male. Uh, this is Rumana Hussain, uh, who is a dear friend, terrific artist from Bombay. Uh, Rumana died very young of, of cancer, breast cancer. He's a totally path breaking artist. Devyani Krishna, a wonderful artist who was our teacher in modern school. Uh, she was my guru in modern school. Uh, pulled out a whole bunch of photographs of Shamshad Hussain because Shamshad died about a month ago in Delhi and uh, which was a very tragic uh, occurrence. Suddenly discovered a very serious uh, liver cancer and he passed away in three weeks. Uh, this is a picture with Krishan Khanna and Shamshad's family. So I pulled out a whole... And this is the thing that happens with photographs, you know, that uh, for instance the Souza picture, you know, I made it as a photograph, but then when passages happen and people pass, suddenly the picture takes on a completely different uh, uh, resonance. So these are a couple of Shamshad. Uh, this is Shamshad in Dubai, in uh, Hussein's flat in exile. Uh, and don't forget that this city exiled Hussein, one of our most loved artists. He could never could never come back. This is uh, Paramjit Singh, <coughs> Nilima Sheikh and Shamshad uh, in Vivan Sundram's house and that's Vivan's picture of his aunt uh, Amrita Sheikh painting in the back. And that's Hussain. You saw that picture of uh, Hussain uh, with me as a kid. This is many years later. Uh, in Delhi, and this is of course called Hussein painting a horse. 
he was actually painting the horse on the other side. Mm. Um, that's Ruth Travar Chapala and oh. Cyrus Chapala. Uh -huh. And again, this was, uh, you know, they lived up the street from us. And I had made this as a family picture and then Ruth passed away. And I had put this on, by then Facebook was around and I had joined, uh, you know, Facebook. And uh, Siddharth, who was editing the Hindu, called me up that night and he said, can we run this on the front page of the Hindu? And I said, absolutely, as a tribute uh, to Ruth. That's Raghubir Singh, the photographer, who's a very close uh, friend of mine. Uh, used to stay with me both in Delhi and in New York. Um, Charles Korea, Mario Miranda, this was in Goa, where Mario was doing, uh, was going to do a mural for Charles's hotel building. So this was the discussion, that's the drawing that you see there. Habib Tanvir and Monica Tanvir. And Habib was somebody I worked with, uh, with in Samat, which I'll talk about, uh, let me keep an eye on the time. Uh, that's Ram Vilas Paswan and Poolan Devi. Ram Vilas Paswan was somebody I had actually got quite close to in my activist uh, mode, uh, no longer very close to him, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and he introduced me to Poolan Devi. This was her first public appearance uh, after her release in Delhi and it was on the platform of his Dalit Sena. Uh, political speech and uh, amazing woman. I mean, I got to know her quite well through through this connection. That's Paswan in his own living room, and the wonderful thing about him was that there were only photographs of him inside the whole house. Uh, he also had that garden swing and an inflated dinosaur in the back. Uh, and I remember I took uh, Geeta Kapoor, the extremely eminent art historian, uh, to, to visit Ram Vilas and she was just fascinated by the interior of his house. I mean, she almost she became very vocal and she could barely stop, you know, agitating and rushing all over the place. Uh, that's Shubha, Shubha Mutgal, uh, singing for an ailing Kefi Asmi. Kefi is on the bed in the back. This is Delhi. Uh, Bina Ramani, De Delhi socialites. I photographed a lot of parties. You saw some of the politicians. I photographed them inside, you know, in uh, intimate situations and in public situations. It was partly the kind of access uh, that I had. This is actually costume party. This is something that I love in Delhi. Uh, the, the kind of theatre of politics. This is a costume party where um, Ashok Nehru is dressed as his uncle, Jawaharlal Nehru. Lalit Nirula is dressed as Karuna Nidhi in the middle. And Bernard E. Masli uh, as Otavio Quattrocchi. But how, you, how do you know that? Because he had an identifying badge on his uh, body. <laughs> Party uh, that's unique Krishnan who was a who was a, who had a party of one person from Kerala uh, was an MP then uh, Mala Singh's house and that of course is uh, Papu Patnaik uh, Naveen Patnaik who uh, you know was a great foppish figure in Delhi before he became chief minister now for 15 years or something of Odisha this was an avatar that no one would have ever predicted. And sitting the bald patch is uh, Jai Ram Ramesh. And that's Uni Krishnan on a platform uh, in front of the Red Fort at a public uh, meeting. Inder Gujral, in his first campaign for Lok Sabha in, uh, in Jalandhar. Sitaram Yechuri and Manmohan before Manmohan became Prime Minister. That's Rajat Sharma. Yeah, they all know. Bala Saraswati, 
and her daughter Lakshmi. Uh, the dance music connection, you know, continued uh, with me and with my interest and uh, Lakshmi's son, Anirudha. Uh, Lakshmi also died. This was not long before Bala died. Uh, this was in Madras. Two great uh, Chao Gurus in Sirai Kela. Uh, this is a Hawaii actor from Gujarat, from a troupe, uh, Ardhana Rishwara. And it's for me the most beautiful Ardhana Rishwara I have ever seen and can beat any Choda sculpture, I think. And I think the, the wonderful ease and casualness of uh, how we can approach our uh, divinity and mythology is, is, is terrific. Unfortunately, which is being sought to be uh, rigid, you know, made into a rigid uh, system. These are all actors from that group. Terrific actors. Famous for doing female roles. These are not uh, transvestites or hijras or transgenders. They're actors who are famous for female roles. Many of these people are actually people that I know very well. Uh, there are very few which are uh, not designed uh, the dark. But that's my Narian Wala in Delhi. <laughs> This is a photograph of Saftar's uh, funeral, Saftar Hashmi, and I'm uh, bringing this in here because I think we will transit to my other avatar quickly. Um, I knew Saftar very well, uh, had worked with him. His death was a great shock when it happened. He was beaten to death uh, while doing a play on the outskirts of Delhi. This was in 1989. And in what has happened very recently, in Maharashtra, in Karnataka, with the killings of, uh, of the two writers in Maharashtra and uh, Kalburgi in Karnataka, you know, this memory of Safta's death has come rising back. In a way, what happened with Safta then was a manifestation of what we were going to become as we became more violent in our everyday politics. Um, this is how I showed my work. This is in Rabindra Bhavan in Delhi. Because of my interest in, uh, in the earlier generation of photographers and our lack of photo histories, I actually got involved in curating work of older photographers. And this was uh, the architectural work of Madan Mahata, absolutely great photographer, but a great, great architectural photographer which I did uh, about two, two and a half years ago. And this, this was brought to Bombay to Max Mueller Bhavan. Um, remarkable work of the modernist architecture of Delhi, part of which I'm going to talk about on Saturday. And I'm going to show a lot of Madan's work uh, in that. And this is the, this is the show of Shunil Jana now on at the NGMA. Uh, Jana was a Communist Party member in the 40s, lived in the commune in Bombay, in Andheri, in the 1940s. Uh, and that's the work that newspaper cover was uh, from 1944. And uh, one of the original pictures in that was in this collection which was discovered in Delhi. This is up, uh, that's the cover of People's War, which is an amazing issue because Jana's pictures and Kefi Azmi's poem on the meeting of uh, Jinnah and Gandhi when Gandhi was trying to prevent partition which happened in Bombay. The meeting of course uh, failed, I mean they didn't come to any, but that's up now at the NGMA. Uh, Jana's industrial photographs. So coming back to Saftar, what happened after Saftar's death is many of us got together, you see the spontaneous uh, funeral, it was the most amazing funeral. 
uh, thousands of people gathered, many of whom had no connection with Safdar. But there was such an uh, emotional response to this killing because he was a actor, he was a street theatre actor, he was not a political worker, he was not a political gunda. And he's somebody who had worked with Bhisham Sani, with Habib Tanvir, you know, with really senior, uh, serious uh, theatre people, directors and actors. Uh, that we ended up forming as a group of artists, actors, musicians, writers, the Saftar Hashmi Memorial Trust, uh, SEMA, which of which I've been a co-member, you know, for many years. The work that we've been, been doing has been in the public sphere, has been using uh, the arts, I wouldn't say using the artists, but giving a platform for artists, musicians, dancers, poets, uh, to take a stand on issues of freedom of expression or against communalism. And especially in those early years, we did these huge uh, public events. We've not actually, quite frankly, been able to do anything in Bombay for many years because this is the most uh, controlled city in the whole of India, as you know, where musicians cannot perform, uh, venues were afraid to give us a platform even for very ordinary exhibitions for many years. But in the beginning of December, the third, the fourth, fifth and sixth, we are going to be a core part of the Times Literary Festival this year. The theme of which is freedom of expression. And I think it's very, very timely. So these are some of the, you know, the exhibitions we had done, images and words. Uh, this was in uh, Jamia a few years ago, 20, 20th anniversary of Sema. Uh, that's Shubha, who's going to be performing at the Times Lit Fest. She's going to be performing her Sema repertoire. Uh, Shubha is somebody who's been very a core member of Sema, and as a classical musician, has has picked texts, whether they're from the Sufi or Bhakti tradition, or from Fares, or from other poets. Uh, which have uh, a meaning uh, about harmony or against uh, repression. So, you know, as a classical singer, she's made quite a strong uh, political statement. Uh, these are the kinds of environments that we create uh, every 1st of January, which is the anniversary of Safta's uh, death. It's turned into like a big secular mela in Delhi. It's a day long goes into the night with poets, classical musicians, rock bands. Indian Ocean recorded their first CD in a Samad program mm -hmm. um, many years ago. Posters, um, this was a number of years ago, also an attacks on artists and writers, you know, and we coming full circle again. These are designed by me. So this is a whole other aspect of my uh, uh, involvement in the arts. This is my more activist uh, avatar. Uh, but much of it is also working with those very same people that I was photographing, the same musicians, the same artists, the same writers. Uh, we defend. We many years we went into this, uh, you know, mode of defense of Hussein, uh, and this is a kind of guerrilla thing that we could do when this very, very good judgment came out from the uh, 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 Delhi High Court uh, by Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, beautifully written judgment in defense of Hussein. We went on the website. We downloaded it and we literally printed this book almost overnight with other essays so that it became a, a document uh, that could be, um, you know, kept and accessed. Uh, sadly, we were never able to, you know, get him back uh, to India. Uh, this was Hamsa Bayodhya, an exhibition that we had done after the demolition of the Babri Masjid, which had traveled and come to Bombay. It was actually in Firoza Godridge's gallery mounted by uh, Rumana all those years ago in 1993. And this was an exhibition which was attacked by the BJP and the VHP, uh, physically attacked in Fezabad. 
and we were slapped with the cases against us, uh, including criminal conspiracy against the state, for having quoted a text from the Dasha Jata, which is one of the earliest versions of the Ram Katha. Hi, Shireen. <laughs> There's a major Ayodhya Samat lady running out there, archaeologist. <laughs> Uh, who was actually part of this, uh, contributed to this exhibition. Uh, this is Tista Setarwar and Romila Thapar uh, at the exhibition, which is still traveling. It became a kit exhibition, very easy to mount, of illustrations and text. Uh, we fought those charges against us in the Delhi High Court. It was an eight-year case, and we won. We had major lawyers, Rajiv Dhawan, etc., fighting for us, pro bono, of course, with a very good judgment, which has become a key in the fight for freedom of expression. <clears throat> Ultimately brought it out in book form a few years ago. And this was uh, in the US. This is the Smart Museum. I had uh, curated. Uh, a history of Samat which traveled in the US and has just uh, come back. Uh, difficult to kind of convey the kind, uh, the kind of work that we had done, a lot of which was in the street, in a museum setting, but we tried our best. Uh, and brought out a big book. I brought one here actually for afterwards you can you know, take a look at this huge uh, book. And this was uh, last week. This is one of our guerrilla productions. Um, this has just been brought out. We will release it at the Times Lit Fest. Uh, there will be copies available. These are uh, extracts in English of the writings of Dhabulkar, Pansare, and Kalburgi in English because they, uh, all, almost all their writing was, was either in Marathi or in Kannada, not accessible uh, to a national audience. So this was done like in you know five days, including the translations. And this was the release of the book. There was this uh, big convention in Delhi uh, called Pratirodh. And that's uh, Krishna Sobti, who is 92 years old. She was carried up on the stage uh, in Mahablankar Hall in a wheelchair, but gave the most unbelievably stirring speech. Uh, I mean, really amazing. And you can see her fist. Look at her fist. And that's uh, M.K. Raina holding the mic. <clears throat> this is a slightly different aspect of my work. You know, I'm, as I said, I'm not a, a, a news photographer, docu I, you know, basically doc do documentary work. But I happened to be in Delhi when <coughs> Indira Gandhi was assassinated in 1984. And I got involved with a team of people taking relief across the Jamuna because there had been, we'd heard there was terrible devastation, many people had been killed across the river and we were told that there were areas where no relief had reached. So this was a few days, uh, like a day or a day and a half after the killing had ended that we go for relief and I had three rolls of film, Tri-X, uh, 35mm camera and I just documented what we saw. And it's very strange because there are very few pictures from 1984 actually left. And uh, these are of survivors. There's no, you don't see any violence in my pictures. This was one of the only men left alive in, in these two gullies where we had reached. That's Premila Dandavate, by the way, in the corner there, for, for those of you. No. Um, I just discovered who she was uh, very recently. This is a uh, wife holding her husband's finger. Uh, it's there in her hand because he, it, it had been chopped off to get his gold ring. Uh, most of the men here were burnt alive with tires being put on their neck and set on fire. But what happened with these pictures is uh, Every time October 31st rolls around, I keep getting called by newspapers, by magazines saying, can we, uh, you know, publish these? I said, of course you can publish them again. It's like this litany of remembering, of not forgetting because there's been no justice 
as yet for the victims of 1984. So two or three years ago, this Jatha was taken out from the Golden Temple in Amritsar to Delhi, carrying these images on huge trucks through the whole of Punjab down to Delhi uh, as part of the call and an exhibition which was carried through Punjab and ended up outside the Gurdwara Bangla Sahib in Delhi of uh, the few photographers who had images we you know all gave the images and an exhibition done like this <coughs> so this is a very different kind of exhibition for a very different kind of purpose and this is where um, and this is how it keeps reappearing in the newspapers this was um, uh, 2014 uh, this year strangely I didn't get any calls for the pictures <coughs> these pictures are of the Gulbarg Society in Ahmedabad uh, which is uh, and this is actually the home of uh, Zakia and Ehsan Jafri uh, who was hacked alive Ehsan Jafri was hacked alive uh, watched by his wife from the upper floor uh, and I had gone here with uh, Tista Setarwar who you all know, who's from Bombay. And we worked, Samath has worked very closely with Tista as a kind of, it's her Delhi base. And we've helped over many years uh, to publicize her campaigns for justice. So I had gone and photographed the ruins of Gulbar. Uh, this was before the 10th anniversary of the killings. This is all Ehsan Jafri's house. And that's um, Salim Sandhi in his house in Gulbarg. And he's standing in the room where his son was murdered and burnt alive. And it was an experience going into these homes with these uh, survivors and listening to their stories. I mean, some of which were absolutely blood good. And when you see this, the fan hanging in uh, Jafri's house, I mean, I won't even tell you what the fan was used for. Um, and that's uh, Zakia Jafri and her son. Uh, Zakia is the one who's still fighting the cases in Gujarat, uh, which are still in the courts, in the, now in the Gujarat High Court. And the number one uh, accused in Zakia's petition is uh, our current Prime Minister. Uh, so the story of the Supreme Court having absolved him is not correct. Uh, the, court, the, the case has not reached the Supreme Court as yet. It's still in the Gujarat High Court. Uh, this was published in Open Magazine. Now this is again, uh, you know, a slightly activist part of my photography, which I've done with the Sikh riots and, and with Gujarat. Uh, I didn't know what I would do with these pictures of Gulbar. But many years before, we had brought uh, survivors from Gujarat with Tista to Delhi in a public hearing, uh, which was enormously effective because we got artists, we got members of parliament, etc., to come and hear their stories and actually to, you know, be with them for two or three days, sit with them, eat, uh, you know, be together. And Kiar Narayanan, who was president at that time, I was shooting the Rashpati Bhavan actually professionally for the first time. And he saw the story in the newspaper and he asked me to bring five of the survivors, including the children, etc., to meet him. It was the first public statement he made. Uh, it was BJP government, of course, at that time, Rajpai government. Um, so that, and what I had done is I had done these very uh, straight portraits of these survivors, again, not knowing what I would do, uh, but I just did it at that time which are these and I ran these in uh, open magazine together but then what I did is on the 10th anniversary I made little prints in these cheap uh, bazaar frames and uh, Shubha Mudgal went and sang in the ruins in Gulbar and we hung these photographs of the survivors in the burnt out houses in Gulbar and um, that's the report in uh, 
the Indian Express of that of that exhibition. And for me, in many ways, that was the most important exhibition I've ever done. Thank you. Yeah, you sure. No, I'm just going to invite you to Michigan when he comes. Are you in Michigan? I've never been to Michigan. So you got to come. There's good architecture. <laughs> and uh, you can visit your grandmother's place in the world, Questions, responses, critiques. Do you ever feel personally threatened by any of these activism? Well, what was that? Being threatened or... Oh, I've been attacked. You have been attacked? Yeah, twice. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, no, physically attacked. Uh, once in Pune with the Hamsabha Yodhya uh, by the RSS, which happened to be right down the street, which we didn't realize. Um, they didn't actually physically attack us but they attacked the exhibition. First of all, I walked them through the exhibition beforehand, explaining everything, uh, showing them all the panels. And then when we began the formal opening, it was done by you know very eminent citizens of in a, in a historical society, beautiful building, not unlike this actually, in a hall like this. And the minute we started a formal thing, they started slogans and ripping the whole thing apart. But they didn't realize that this was a exhibition that we had done in multiples. It was offset printed because it was cheaper to reproduce images like that than photographic prints. So we could mount the whole thing in an hour again. <laughs> yeah. So that was one attack and the other attack was in Columbia University in New York, which was also the RSS where uh, the exhibition premiered on the first anniversary of the demolition in the South Asia Institute and there was a formal uh, symposium with um, uh, uh, Gayatri Spivak, uh, you know, eminent faculty from Columbia on the stage. I mean, I was an interloper amongst all these senior academics. And uh, they kicked up a huge fuss. They said, how can you speak? How, why do you have a name like Ram Rahman? Uh, you know, what are you? And how dare you speak on the Ramayana, uh, etc. And there was, a, like, there was a physical assault. And Raghubir Singh, who used Nikons, which is a very strong camera. Raghubir happened to be there, you know, below. We were on a slightly raised podium. And he was literally running around hitting these people on the head <laughs> with his Nikon. And the campus police had to be called in. I mean, it was quite a, uh, it turned into quite a melee. It's become a historic event. I was really uh, moved by what you showed us, and I'm going to come to the next lecture as well. I was wondering um, if your, you've travelled with your work to Pakistan and Bangladesh. Actually, I personally haven't, but Hamsa Bayodhya went to Pakistan. Okay. It, was, it was shown at the press club in Lahore. Uh, number of years ago and, and the whole premise of that exhibition was to counter the kind of mythology which had been created around Ayodhya and was showing Ayodhya through multiple layers and showing how you know Ayodhya is actually everybody's and actually I learned a lot because we had you know eminent uh, archaeologists like the lady who just snuck out uh, Romila Thapar, Irfan Habib, you know one of the great things of artists like me who've been involved with Samad is that we've had a chance to work with scholars like this, uh, which is incredible. It's like a whole other university education, you know, every week. Uh, because they give lectures, you sit, discuss issues. Uh, when you're signing a petition, you're crafting a letter, you discuss. So, uh, 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 why did I get into this? Oh yeah, so it was take, so the premise of the exhibition was to show the layers uh, of mytho you know mythological stories associated with the city, uh, actual histories of Ayodhya, which are uh, uh, ancient <coughs> histories, archaeological history, art history. We showed a lot of the architecture, the art that actually came out from Faisabad. 
uh, paintings by Faizullah and by Tilly Kettle. Late Mughal painter, British painter working exactly at the same time. Oil paintings, miniatures. So it was quite, a, and this was all stolen material. We, you know, lifted from books from British Library, no uh, permissions. It was all, uh, it was all copy left, uh, and produced, you know, uh, in in the uh, hundreds. Uh, and that exhibition upset a lot of people. The, the, the text that we were attacked on was actually sourced from Romila, which was a, the Dasha Jata. Uh, as I said, it's one of the earliest versions of the Ram Katha, and in that, Rama, Sita, and Lakshmana are, are all siblings. Wow. And there's no Ravana, there's no kidnapping, but they do get banished into the forest for 14 years. And when Dasha dies, they come back, and he's the king of Kashi in that in that version. It's not a very long Jatak tale. They come back to Kashi, and the story says it's written in uh, uh, Pali that uh, Rama and Sita rule for 64,000 years. So what we were accused of was blasphemy, you know. Of, but this wasn't a text that we had written. We were quoting, uh, you know, uh, yeah, an ancient text. So it became a big issue, which is why Columbia asked me to uh, bring the exhibition there, uh, because it became an issue of academic freedom. Because effectively, the ban that was imposed on us meant that any inspector or lower level, up to some level of policeman, could enter your home. And if you had the Dasha Jatak there, you could be arrested. And that could be the Dasha Jatak in any language. So what we did is we continued showing the exhibition, but I put black lines through that paragraph. It was just a short paragraph. So you could see the, you know, the X, just through the X height, so you could see the, uh, the rest of the type. But then we put the, the book where, in various translations along with the exhibitions said that if you want to know the text, here's the text, but we can't show it there. Um, so it was quite, uh, you know, quite a uh, strange uh, episode. And over Bangladesh? Uh, I don't think the exhibition has gone to Bangladesh. But I'm getting, uh, for this Lit Fest, I'm getting Shahid Ul Alam, who's a photographer, a colleague of mine, to come and speak on what is going on with the bloggers. Uh, because Shahidul is a photographer who runs a big photo festival but is also a blogger and quite politically involved and Shahidul is now on the hit list uh, of, of these bloggers who've already been uh, actually hacked to death, which is almost worse. So he'll be here in December uh, speaking. Fourth, fifth and sixth at the Mehboob studio. I'm not sure what the. Do you? I think anyone can go. As far as I know. I mean, I didn't even ask, but I think. Yeah. What's that? It's open to the public, yeah. When are you at the Bhagavad Gita? When? Oh, Saturday is my talk on um, a very different talk. It's on the modern architecture of Delhi. Uh, that's at 6 o'clock, I think. Yeah, 6 o'clock. And actually, it's a very interesting talk, so do come. It's an area that very few people actually have really looked at. And again, it's something I know from the inside. So it's worth, it's worth coming to. So, Photograph ordinary people as well as yeah. the arches. So, why do you think uh, we in India have elected a prime minister or a political party which has a history, you know, intolerant? Like, who, what? I mean, it's such a majority they have got. No, that's not true. Uh, well, that's a, you know, I mean, my God, I'm not a political pundit, but they didn't get a majority. They had 31% of the vote, so that's not a majority vote. Um, well, I don't know, that any number of people can talk about, you know, why it happened and what happened. Um, her question was that why 
have we elected a, a government like the government that we have with a political party which has a history of intolerance? But it happens in other countries too. No, it has happened. But, uh, well, you know, my own reading, you see, as Samad for years we've been yelling about this whole issue of um, intolerance of attacks. People like Hussein, and one of the problems, Ayodhya, what happened after you, and we were attacked, by the way, very strongly by other political parties, including the communists, uh, particularly the CPM, on our, on the exhibition, Hamsab Ayodhya, etc., because what was happening was that every political formation was stepping back when these attacks were coming from the right wing because they were too scared to take an actual stand against them. And it's happened over many years. And each time they step back, step back, step back. Uh, and it was, they thought this was in their political, you know, interest to kowtow to what was being built as a majority uh, feeling. And I think that's something that we've been screaming about for years. You know, we've gone and met all the political leaders of you know, you name it, from the socialists to the, you know, leaders from the south, screaming about this, saying that you have to do something, you have to take a stand, you have to take a stand on Hussein, you've got to get him back. They backtracked, you know, they were too scared. I don't know the reasons why Sardar has been Well, uh, what happened with Saftar, actually, that was... Uh, uh, he was, uh, he, he had a street theatre group called Jana, Jan Nartya Manch, uh, which was part of the Communist Party Marxist. It was, uh, Saftar was a member of the Communist Party Marxist. Uh, when we set up Samat, we were not associated, we very deliberately kept away from associating with any political party, even though there were many people, you know, from the left who were in Samat. Uh, they were performing a play in support of a labor strike outside a factory in Sahibabad. And there was also a local election about to happen. So there was like this local election fever. And he was basically attacked by uh, goons who were linked to the Congress party. H.K.L. Uh, Bhagat, who was a minister then, had an influence in that area. And, uh, and I think, I mean, he was, I don't think he was targeted because they knew who he was. It was just like a, uh, you know, a goon attack on this theatre group who were performing. Uh, and he managed to get everyone, you know, jump over the wall, he got everyone uh, out. But he was caught before he could jump over the wall and he was basically beaten to death and dragged down. Um, and a about 10 or 12 days later, there was a film festival in Delhi, where with an HKL Bhagat, I think, was information broadcasting minister and was at the film festival. And Shabana, uh, who hadn't met Saftar, didn't know Saftar, took a little leaflet that we had printed and were handing out at the film festival. Uh, not in very good English, I have to admit, uh, because it was again done really quickly in this little printing press in Old Delhi. But she took it up on stage and she read it out in front of uh, Bhagat. And it caused a huge, uh, you know, uproar because um, it was done in in a very public forum with uh, John Schlesinger, the great British director, on the stage, etc. Um, so that was Saftar's killing. But his killers, by the way, which was quite astonishing, it took 15 years for the case, but they got life imprisonment, uh, all 15, which is quite astounding because the case happened in UP, which is not very known for um, for uh, for its legal uh, system, but it did happen, which is which is quite astonishing. That's it. Yeah.